Let me ask you this right off the bat. What is the first word of the gospel? What is the first word of the gospel? It is repent. It is repent. In Matthew chapter 3, 2, when John the Baptist came preaching, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began his ministry, he said, repent and believe in the gospel. Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, said that he went around preaching, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the struggle that we have today when we talk about the gospel is that most people leave out, repent, and go straight to faith. And if you were to ask someone, what is the gospel and what does a person need to do to be saved, you would probably hear this answer. Well, you need to place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is true, but that is only half of the whole proposition. You also need to repent. And that is what is lacking in many churches and in many teachings today. We have dropped repentance. Part of that is because there's this idea that repentance is a work. And if you do a work of repentance, now you have added works to salvation and salvation is no longer of grace. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. Repentance is also a gift of God, just as faith is a gift of God. And repentance is authenticated by works. It is shown to be genuine by works, but repentance in and of itself is not a work, just as faith is not a work. When you come to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, God requires throughout the word of God that we repent, which means to turn away from our sins So that we can turn to Christ and to place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as being the one who is our refuge from our sin and from the subsequent wrath of God for our sin. You know, some of us who are old enough to be antiques can probably remember the definition of love that came out in the 1970s because of a movie called Love Story. It went like this. Love is never having to say you're sorry. Now, I can remember I was a senior in high school and I was taking a creative writing class at the time so that I could graduate. I lacked one English credit. And so they stuck me in this creative writing class with a bunch of girls. The teacher was enamored with that phrase, just enamored with it. And so she had us write an essay on love is never having to say you're sorry. Well, again, being an 18 year old on my way to the military who was being forced to take an English class that he loathed from a woman teacher that he really did not like, but needed to pass in order to get out of school. I wrote my essay, but it was not what the teacher wanted to hear. I wrote that that definition I still remember was shallow, stupid, wrong, dull, unrealistic and completely unbiblical. I'm sure that I had a real mighty spiritual impact upon her life, right? Well, I did pass the class, but I did not receive the student of the semester award in creative writing because love is having to say you're sorry, right? Love is having to say you're sorry and a whole lot more. Well, there's another phrase that is kind of shallow and wrong and unrealistic and stupid and dull and completely unbiblical. And it's this repentance is simply having to say you're sorry. That is just as wrong as love is never having to say you're sorry. And the problem is, is that the phrase sounds just about right, doesn't it? It sounds just about right to say that repentance is simply saying you're sorry. And that's exactly the problem, because it's just about right. It's wrong. Listen, if it's not completely right, it's wrong, right? So when you say something biblically is just about right, and if you ever hear a preacher get up in the pulpit and say, well, this is just about right, what you need to understand is that it's wrong. Because if it's not exactly right, biblically, it's wrong. Saying that repentance is simply saying you're sorry is not exactly right, and thus it's wrong. Repentance is much more than simply saying you're sorry. Now, don't get me wrong. Repentance is does include saying you're sorry. Repentance 
does include having sorrow over sin, but it must go far beyond sorrow over sin if it is to be true and genuine biblical repentance over and from sin. That's what we're going to talk about today, repentance. And before we get to Nehemiah chapter 10, we're going to take a quick trip into the New Testament just to kind of get us where we need to be. But before we do that, let's pray and let's ask God to help us understand repentance. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. And I pray that you will help us to understand what repentance truly is and help us to understand that repentance is the key to experiencing life after sin. Father, there are so many Christians who are not experiencing life after great sin or great struggles with sin or great times in their lives when they gave themselves to sin. And the reason why they do not experience life after sin is because they have never truly understood what repentance is. And I pray today that you will use our teaching in the book of Nehemiah to free us from the sins of our past and the sins of even our present. As we look and understand what is required to free us from these things, help us to understand your word. And we'll thank you in Jesus name. Amen. In Second Corinthians seven, once you go there very quickly with me as we make our way backwards to the book of Nehemiah. Second Corinthians chapter seven, Paul talks about the sorrow that leads to repentance. And he says in Second Corinthians seven, verse eight, for though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. Now, understand what he's saying there is their sorrow was not repentance. Their sorrow over their sin was not repentance. The sorrow over their sin led them to repentance. And so if you find yourself in a sin, you're committing a sin against the Lord. And we do it every day. At least I do. And you have a need of repentance in your life. If you simply think that the sorrow that you feel over committing that sin is your repentance, you're wrong. It's a part of it. But if you stop with sorrow over sin, you have not truly repented. And that's why there are so many believers today who are still caught in the chains and in the bondage of sin and can't get free to experience life after sin because they're still in their sin because they've not truly turned away from it so as to turn to God. Sorrow leads you to repentance. He goes on to say, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnest this this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. You see, the difference between godly repentance and false repentance, true repentance and false repentance, false repentance is simply sorrow over what you have done. It might be sorrow that you got caught. It might be sorrow over the consequences that are going to come upon you for what you've done. It might be sorrow over the fact that that you were going 180 days straight, hadn't fallen into the pit. And on the 181st day, you blew it. Now you got to start all over marking those notches on your calendar. That is worldly sorrow. It is a sorrow that does not go beyond the sin. Godly sorrow that leads to repentance is a sorrow and a remorse over your sin that leads you to do something about it. It is a sorrow that causes a change of thinking and then a change of living that does something about the sin that you have committed in Luke chapter three, if you turn there very quickly, Luke chapter three, we're going the right direction. Luke chapter three. And remember what Scott said. You know, I get I get at least six more minutes at the end here. okay? because this is going to be a long one. Luke three, John the Baptist is preaching. And just so you understand, he is preaching the gospel. I want you to look over at verse 18 
So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. Now, I want you to see how he preached the gospel. Look at Luke chapter three, verse seven. Here's how he begins the message. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. I mean, can you imagine me getting up here some Sunday morning and saying, you bunch of snakes crawling in the grass? Who warns you to come to church today? You bunch of hypocrites. I mean, can you imagine preaching like that? Well, that's what he does. You brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Listen, this is good gospel preaching because he starts with their need. He says, you know what? You're in trouble. You're a brood of snakes. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You think you're righteous. You think that because Abraham's your father, that you're going to have eternal life. Let me tell you, God's axe is already laid at the root of your tree and he's ready to start swinging and cut you down and then burn you. Now, do you think that got the attention of these people? It would get my attention, wouldn't it? It'd get your attention. He's telling them, you know what? You're in trouble. You've offended a holy God. And God's axe is at the root of your life and he's ready to start swinging. He's ready to cut you out. You see, that is what is missing in the church today. Now, I'm not saying that we do not emphasize God's grace because we always emphasize God's grace. When we emphasize God's holiness, we emphasize God's grace. The problem is we don't emphasize God's holiness anymore. We don't emphasize God's standards. We don't emphasize the fact that the reason why there is salvation is because there's a need for salvation. And that need for salvation is that we are under the wrath of God for our sins. And that unless we realize it, we will never run to God as our refuge. So that's how John starts his preaching. But he says to them, verse eight, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Repentance has fruits. There are things in your life that will authenticate whether or not your repentance is real. And if these things are not in your life, then you can be assured that your and my repentance is not real. And it was simply a sorrow over sin that did not lead to repentance. The people in verse 10 were questioning him, saying, what shall we do? And he said to them. The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. In other words, you need to change. There needs to be a change of thinking. And by the way, the word repentance means a change of heart or a change of mind. But the problem is, is some people have have said, you know what? That's all repentance means. Keep in mind that whenever you come to the word of God and you do a word study, don't miss the second step. So many people miss the second step. They go to their lexicons. They go to their dictionaries. They, they find out what the word means in Greek or Hebrew, and they think they've got the definition of the word. You don't have the definition of the word until you find out how the word was used. I can go to the dictionary and find the definition of gay. And I guarantee you it does not mean that today. Because how the word is used tells you what the word means. When you go to the word of God, you find out what it means and then you've got to find out how it's used. You've got to find out how it's used in Scripture. You've got to find out how it's used in that particular book. You've got to find out how is it used by that particular writer. Or else you're not going to understand really what the word means. And when you come to repentance, so many people have stopped with the definition, a change of mind or a change of heart. If that's as far as you go, you've missed repentance. Because when you come to the word of God, you see that the word is used in this way. A change of mind and a change of heart that leads to a change of activity, a change of behavior, a change of desire, a change of affections. Now, am I saying that you clean the fish before you save the fish? No, I'm not saying that before you catch the fish. I'm not saying that that we need to be telling people you need to change your life so you get saved. That's not what I'm saying. What? John the Baptist is saying here in Luke chapter 3 is this, is if you have true repentance, 
that has been given to you by God, just as faith is given to you by God, that true repentance that will lead to salvation is going to bear fruit. You're going to see changes in your life. And it's not the changes of life that are going to save you, but the changes in your life are going to authenticate what? That the repentance was real and that you're saved. And it's the same thing as a Christian after you are saved. When you and I have to repent of sin, if all we have is sorrow over our sin, that's not repentance. That sorrow leads us to a change of thinking, which then leads us to a change of behavior. And if we truly repented, we're going to have a change of mind that leads to a change of activity, a change of behavior, a change of desires, a change of affections. With that background, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10. Again, we're in the last section of Nehemiah. And the section goes together. In fact, I was actually going to preach Nehemiah 10, 11 and 12 today, but thought better of it as I was out in the mountains. Probably good I was out there for a while to think about that. <clears throat> that would have been at least a three and a half hour sermon, but I thought being a holiday weekend, we're going to be low anyway. We are. So maybe I better not try and pull that off. So we'll break it up. In Nehemiah chapter 10, what we're going to see is that biblical repentance requires that we make new commitments if we are to experience life after sin. Now, I want you to understand, we're talking to believers now. We're talking to people who have already placed faith in God here in Nehemiah chapter 8. They've come to him. They realize that he is the one that is their atoning sacrifice for sin, that that day of atonement was a picture of that. They've placed their faith in him. They've come to a point where they're beginning to repent of national sins or repenting of personal sins. And in Nehemiah chapter 10, they give us this, this great prayer that shows you the sorrow over their sin. You see how badly they feel for the sins that they have committed against God. But that's not repentance. That's the sorrow over their sin. And then you come to chapter 9, verse 38. And it's a very important verse in this whole section. It says this. Now, because of all this, because of what's gone in the past, chapter 9, because of our great prayer, because of our sorrow over our sin, because of this, we're going to do something. Now, look at what they're going to do. We're making an agreement in writing, and this agreement is going to be with God. And on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. In other words, because of the sorrow over our sin which led us to pray to God and confess our sin to God, we now are taking it a step further. And God, we're making an agreement with you. God, we're making a covenant with you. God, we're making a rededication to you. God, we are going to put something in writing, and this is what we want to see changed in our lives because we truly want to repent. And so in chapter 10, what you have are the new commitments that come about as a result of their sorrow over their sin. And that is their repentance. And then in chapter 11 and 12, you're going to see, and we'll cover this next week, that biblical repentance requires that we unite our sorrow over sin and our commitment to no longer sin with the promises of God's grace in order to fulfill those promises and truly experience life after sin. That's going to be a very important message, because let me tell you, here's what happens with a lot of believers. They fall into sin. They fall into sin habits. They fall into areas or times of their life where they look more like an unbeliever than a believer. And I don't know, maybe none of you have ever experienced that. I have. Where if you look at my life, I would look more like an unbeliever on that day than I would look like a believer. Or more like an unbeliever that week or that month or maybe even that year than a believer. And if people were looking at me, they wouldn't know the difference. But God brings me to a point of repentance but the problem that I had and that I had was simply this. I don't know that God really wants my fellowship anymore. I really don't know that God wants my service anymore. I don't know that God wants me to worship him anymore. I don't know that I'm worthy to be able to come back into his family again. Anybody here ever had those kind of doubts? Well, that's what Nehemiah 11 and 12 are talking about. That when you repent, you better unite the promises of God with your repentance and you better believe that God does want you back. And he does want your service. And he does want your fellowship. And he does want your worship. And that the greater the sin, the greater the repentance, the greater the service can be. And the greater the worship can be. 
And then you come to Nehemiah chapter 13, and that's the saddest chapter of the whole book because it all falls apart. Nehemiah goes back to Susa. He's gone for a period of years. He comes back, and the very people that make this commitment have fallen back into sin, the very sins they had repented of. And you know what you learn in Nehemiah chapter 13? Repentance is fragile. It's fragile. If you don't keep it up every day, if you don't walk, as the song said, in the cross, near the cross, with its shadow over you every day, it won't be long before you are falling right back into your old sinful habits again. So we're going to be looking at repentance for the next few weeks. In Nehemiah chapter 10, what we're going to learn today is simply this. If we as believers are to experience soul-satisfying joyful and sin-killing, victorious life after sin. And this is all in the outline, so if you're trying to write this down, it's on the outline. Our repentance over our personal sin must entail more than mere sorrow over sin. We must unite to our sorrow new and earnest commitments that authenticate the genuineness of our repentance. Number one. Biblical repentance requires an earnest commitment to holiness. Now, here's the earnest commitment. It's in verse 38 of chapter 9 again. Now, because of all this, we are making an agreement. That in Hebrew is an earnest agreement in writing. It's almost a double emphasis there because the word agreement is talking about an earnest agreement, something that that they're going to put their blood, sweat and tears into. But more than that, they're also going to write it down. They want to be held accountable to this change of life that is being brought about by sorrow over their sin. And so they wrote out the agreement and then they signed the agreement. And in chapter 10, verses 1 through 27, you have the list of those who signed the agreement. And then you come to verse 28 and you see something very significant about the agreement. Look at what it says. Now, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding. That verse is a description of the people that were experiencing sorrow over their sin and were making this agreement. This is before they even make the agreement. This is what they're experiencing in their life. They had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God. So before they ever make the agreement outlining what their repentance is going to be, their godly sorrow over their sin had led them to already do something. Separate from the peoples of the lands so that they could separate themselves to the law of God. Now, what's important to understand here is that the word for separate in Hebrew is badal. Badal is a strong Hebrew word which means to sever, to separate, to divide to exclude, to withdraw from, to take the knife to. Strong Hebrew word. And what they're actually separating from is not the individual people that lived in the land. Peoples of the lands. You have to understand there were many peoples, cultures, people groups living in Judah. And what the people were doing is separating themselves from those ungodly cultures, those ungodly People groups and the practices and the ideologies and the philosophies and the beliefs that they held to because they were dragging them into sin. So very simply what they were doing and probably the first fruit of repentance, the first commitment that one who really wants to repent is simply this. You've got to separate from that which caused the sin in the first place. You see, they realized that they had been following the cultures around them, ungodly culture around them. You know, and it's very interesting. You know, you can say, well, I, I don't want to follow the culture, the ungodly culture that pervades America right now. Well, what do, you, what do you mean when you say that? I mean, what are you really saying? I mean, how do you separate yourself from a culture? Well, what you're talking about is that you want to separate yourself from those things in the culture that are anti-God and ungodly, And that are causing you not to be godly. So what things in the culture might they have been separating themselves from? Well, they're separating themselves from a philosophy of life that was anti-God. They separated themselves from practices 
that did not exhibit that they were godly. They separated themselves from from different kinds of behaviors, different kinds of activities, different kinds of mindsets, because those things were part of that anti-God culture. And so the very first thing they do is they make a commitment to holiness, holiness. The word holiness comes from another word that also means to separate. It's used in conjunction with separating yourself from sin so as to separate yourself to God. Now, now, why is that important and why is that such a, a huge thing to get our minds around? Because you can't have fellowship with God and fellowship with sin at the same time. You can't love God and love sin at the same time. You can't be trying to, to nurture a relationship with God and nurture your sin at the same time. And holiness requires that you separate from your sin so that you can separate to God. And these people realize that. And so their godly sorrow led them first and foremost to an earnest commitment to separate from that which was around them that was leading them into sin. Because they realized they couldn't be coddling that and trying to nurture a relationship with God at the same time. It would not work. It would not work. Look over at Psalm 119, verse 115 for just a moment. Psalm 119 is a a great psalm talking about separating yourself from certain things so that you can obey the word of God. Psalm 119, verse 115. Depart. There's that very interesting word cut off with a knife. Depart from me, evildoers. So that I may observe the commandments of my God. You know, there are things probably in all of our lives that keep us from being as devoted to God as we should be. And some of those things may not all be what we would classify as sin. There may be some good things in our lives that keep us from obeying God and being devoted to God. You know, some of us have our plates pretty full. And sometimes our plates are full of necessary things, but sometimes we can pile our plate full of good things to the point that we no longer have time for God and obedience to God for God. The very first thing which authenticates true repentance in a person's life is their willingness to leave, to cut off those things whether they be ideologies, philosophies, practices, relationships, organizations, favorite TV programs, hobbies, games, habits, etc., which prevents them or hinders them from obedience to the Word of God. Now, I don't know what it might be for you. I'm asking the Lord to show me what it is for me because I want to be devoted to Him. Thus, the man who's truly repentant of viewing pornography is going to unite to his feelings of sorrow over looking at pornography actions. He's going to start cutting things out of his life that caused him to look at that. Now, I'm understanding as as much as you are that it's our depravity that causes us to do that. But the man, the Christian man who wants to be holy and wants to live for God and wants to repent of that sin can't just stop with sorrow over the sin and say, I'm sorry. He needs to make some new commitments in his life. And those commitments may seem very silly to a woman. Such things as when I go to the grocery store, I'll stay away from the magazine rack. Such things as when I'm driving down the interstate, I may not be able to be looking at that billboard. Such things as when I'm checking out, I may not be able to look at all the soft porn stuff that's there. Keep in mind, a woman may not understand what a man goes through in the world today. There's a naked woman around every corner on every magazine cover. And sometimes you're at a point where you're like this, just trying, oh, my heaven, you know. And you may see your husband someday going like that. Well, don't make fun of him. He's taken the steps to keep himself from going into that sin again. It requires that he separate himself. There may be places that that man can't go. But again, if if his repentance simply stops with sorrow, that's not repentance. It needs to be followed by action. What am I going to do? What am I going to separate from so that I can obey the word of God? How about the woman who's truly repentant over her sin of impulse buying on a credit card? After she feels sorrow over her sin, 
If it's really repentance, she's going to have to unite to that sorrow, a new and earnest resolve not to give herself to that kind of buying again. And she may have to cut up the credit card. She may have to say, you know what, when I go shopping, husband, you're going to have to go with me. Or, you know what, I'm going to have to make a list of everything I'm going to buy and I'm not going to deviate from the list. But the point is, if all you are is sorrowful over your sin, that's not repentance. Repentance is, what are the actions you're going to take not to fall into that sin again? The second thing, biblical repentance requires an earnest commitment to preferring obedience to God's word over disobedience to God's word. Look at verse 29. These people, all who had knowledge and understanding... And that's a good if if you want to know if you have knowledge and understanding, you're going to be the kind of person who separates yourself from the ungodly culture of of your day so that you can separate yourself to the law of God. Let me just make this point. Christians who play with sin and they simply say, well, you know what? There's really nothing wrong with it. And, and, you know, I mean, everybody's doing it. And there's there's a few bad things, a few things that aren't quite right. You know, the philosophy kind of kind of leans maybe a little bit out there a little bit. Let me tell you what, you're not an understanding and knowledgeable spiritual person. The spiritually knowledgeable and understanding person is going to be the person who takes a knife and says, shit, out of here. I don't want nothing to do with it. I want to be devoted to the Lord. Therefore, I will cut it out of my life. Even if it hurts, I'm going to cut it out of my life because I want to be devoted to the Lord. I think the people that play with their sin are, are basically spiritually dull, not knowledgeable, certainly not understanding. Verse 29, these are the people who are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to observe all the commandments of God, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. So the second thing that they did is very interesting. Is they made an earnest commitment to prefer obedience. Here, here's what you see here, and, and, and this is what well, you've got to take the time to read this. New American Standard brings it out probably better than any other version. Notice they took to themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to do something else. To keep and to observe all the commandments of God our Lord. In other words, they made a distinction between walking in God's law and obeying God's law. And that is seen because the the word that's used here, which is being translated by our connective and, is a Hebrew conjunctive which makes the next phrase stand by itself. It's a conjunctive that makes the next phrase stand all by itself. In other words, there are two different phrases. Walking in the law of the Lord and obeying the law of the Lord are two different things, what Nehemiah is saying. In other words, if you think that repentance is simply this sorrow over sin and then this dutiful kicking and screaming, I'm going to obey the word of God no matter what, even if I do love that sin. And how many of us have ever been in that game where it's willpower? I mean, you're sitting there. You've got a problem with obesity. You know there's this chocolate, and I'm a chocoholic, let me tell you. You know there's this chocolate cake in the, in, the, in the refrigerator, and I care nothing for the cake. I just want the icing. I frustrate my kids and wife to no end, because when the cake's out there, I take the knife and just cut the icing off, and I leave the cake. And I think I'm doing everybody a service. If you like the cake, you get the cake, I take the icing. I love it. If there's chocolate ice cream in the freezer, it's not there long. I am a chocoholic. But I need to lose a few pounds. The Lord convicts me, Mark. You need to get the weight down a little bit. You're, you're living an undisciplined life as far as, as how you're eating right now. And so I'm sitting there with my chair facing the refrigerator. I don't want to sin, but I want the chocolate. I don't want to sin, but I can't. I gotta have, you know. and, and that's how we see obedience sometimes. This dutiful, drag my feet, kicking and screaming, but I'm not going to do it. Well, see, Nehemiah and these people were very spiritually astute because before they got to obedience, the commitment was to walk in the law of the Lord. To walk in the law of the Lord, the word means to walk alongside of the law as a friend, as a companion. To walk alongside because you prefer to be with that rather than with something else. The idea behind repentance is this. Repentance. 
Biblical repentance requires that you cut from your life those things that really are leading you the wrong way. And number two, that you learn to develop a preference for the word of God, a preference for obedience, a preference for God that is greater and more satisfying than your sin. Listen, you and I will never, ever be able to defeat our sin habits unless we find something else that gives us greater joy. That's just the way we're wired. You, you can fight it with willpower all you want, but one day your willpower will break, I guarantee it. Death or the breaking of your willpower, one of those will come first. If you're trying to fight sin because you've got a superior will, willpower, let me tell you, you're going to fail eventually. The way you defeat sin is by finding a superior pleasure and treasure. And so what Nehemiah is saying is repentance requires that you begin to cultivate a relationship with God and with his word that gives you more joy than your sin does. And when you're faced with that sin, now here's what the choices are for you. It's not simply committing the sin. It's if I commit that sin, I'm going to lose my pleasure in God and my pleasure in his word. And I'm going to give myself to this temporary inferior pleasure for the next 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm going to lose the greater treasure and pleasure, which is my Lord, until I have to come back and restore fellowship. And da 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 da. He says, you know, develop a preference for God and for His Word. Number three, biblical repentance requires an earnest commitment to demonstrate the absolute priority God has in your life. Look at verses 30 and 31. Now, they, they made the general commitment to walk on the law, Lord, and to observe all the commandments of God. And verses 30 and 31, they now get specific and they highlight two commandments. They highlight two things that God told them that they shouldn't do. They said, and we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Now, it's interesting when you come to commentaries, when commentaries get to to Nehemiah chapter 10, most of them, I shouldn't say commentaries, popular authors who write books on Nehemiah. For some reason, when they get to Nehemiah 10, they skip 10, 11 and 12 and jump right to 13. And the reason they do so is they say, because that section is focusing on the law. And since we're not under the law, That really has no bearing upon us. Keep in mind this. When you come to the word of God, there's two presuppositions you always have to maintain. Number one, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? The second presupposition is this. Even though all scripture may not be to us directly, all scripture is for us, right? If you have a passage of Scripture that was written specifically to Joshua in the Old Testament, you say, well, that's not to me, that's to Joshua. It may not be to you, but it's for you. It's still for you. And so even though I don't think that we're certainly we're not we're not worshiping on Saturday today. We're not we're not Sabbath keepers as as they were in the Old Testament. Um, we're not following all the law in regard to that. Christ was the fulfillment of the law. However, this still has principles for us, and I want you to see what they are and not to skip this. The reason why they highlighted these two aspects of the law, the marital law and the Sabbath law, is because these two aspects of the law clearly demonstrated something about how they felt about God that they needed to reinstate in their life And other people needed to see the reason why they would give their daughters and their sons in marriage to unbelievers in the land was not for love. Keep in mind that in this day, people rarely married for love. Okay, love developed out of that relationship. But it wasn't as though they met somebody at the bank and fell in love and and they got married. That's not why they got married. When a parent would give their son or their daughter in marriage to someone, and especially to those who were not of Israel, a Hebrew descent, it was because they needed security. Now, they've just come back from Babylon into Judah. 
They are the minority, and they're beginning to populate the little towns throughout Judah who are populated with the peoples of the lands. And in order to have some sense of security and the ability to, to promote commerce and be able to have the ability to start a business or begin to work with these people, the easiest way to do it was say, hey, how about if I give you my son and you give me your daughter or I'll give you my daughter and, and let our kids get married and we'll develop this relationship. That's why they did it. And as they did that, that would allow them to be secure and have uh, family taking care of them now. And so that would assure their prosperity to a certain degree. And so what when they say that, that they're no longer going to do that, the reason why they highlighted this is because they're saying this. You know what? We are no longer going to scheme through our problems and sin against the Lord in order to get out of a tough spot. Because that's what they're doing. We want to show people that we're willing to trust the Lord, even in the midst of a difficult situation, rather than to figure a way out of that situation through sin. And we're going to show that God is more important to us than our prosperity. God is more important to us than our security. God is more important to us than our ability to conduct business and commerce. And we're going to trust God. That's why they highlighted marriage. Now, why did they highlight the Sabbath? Well, if you, if you look at verse 31 again, what they're highlighting about the Sabbath was that the peoples of the land, the unbelievers, those who were not Hebrews, were bringing wares and food and grain on the Sabbath day to sell, and they were buying it on the Sabbath day. And here in their repentance, they're saying, we're no longer going to do that. Now, you have to understand, this is a big move because that was the day they came. You, you didn't have refrigerators. You didn't have freezers. In other words, you bought your food on a daily, maybe a two-day or maybe a three-day basis. If you had dry goods you needed, you had to get them when the grocer came by. And so what was happening is the unbelieving cultures of the day were bringing all their stuff on the Sabbath. And the people, because that was the day they brought them, they'd go out and violate the Sabbath in order to buy their food and their provisions. What they're saying here is this. You know what? We're no longer going to violate God's law in order to meet our material, physical needs. We're going to trust God to take care of us. Now, that was quite a demonstration of making much of God. Because whenever you say to people, you know what? I am not willing. I am not willing to violate the integrity of the Scriptures to take care of my personal needs. I will simply trust God to take care of my needs. I will do what God says I can do. I will do what God allows me to do. But I will not violate and disobey the Scriptures in order to make sure my needs and my family's needs are taken care of. That was repentance. And that was a repentance that showed to the unbelieving Gentiles who were watching as they would come and bring their wares on the Sabbath day and the Jews would say, we're not buying today. But you got to because we're going to be in the next next town tomorrow and we won't be back here for a week and you're not going to have nothing to eat. We're not buying today. You come back tomorrow. Now, isn't it interesting, too, that they actually changed the culture of their day by their obedience to the law? Because then the Gentiles had to say, well, if we're going to make any money, I guess we're going to have to come back and we're going to have to compromise and we're going to have to not do selling on that day. And so they actually were infecting their culture by taking a stand. But the repentance was an earnest commitment to demonstrate the absolute priority that God had in their life. They were not going to disobey God's word in order to take care of their material needs. Now, how does that apply today? Well, whenever we have needs, whenever we have material needs, necessities that need to be met, are we willing to violate God's word in order to get them met? Or are we simply going to say, I'm not going to violate the integrity of the word of God. I am going to trust God. Look with me at Matthew 6 real quick. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Verse 31, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. 
Now, what's interesting here is this, is that when we are willing to violate the integrity of the word of God in order to meet our needs, we become like the unbelievers who are scraping and clawing and do whatever it takes to get what they need. When we say we're not going to play that game, we're going to trust the Lord and we're going to do what he's told us to do. Then we show the world that he's the priority in our life, not our stomach, not our bodies, not our houses, those kinds of things. Let's go to the last point. We'll move through this quickly. It's found in verses 32 through 39. Biblical repentance requires an earnest commitment to demonstrate the fact that God is our greatest treasure and pleasure in life by being willing to sacrifice all of our lesser treasures and pleasures, and they're all lesser, for his glory in service to him. From 32 to 39, they begin to consider the temple and what needs to take place in the temple. And you've got to understand, they had really neglected the temple for years. The temple has been built for many, many years. And they had neglected the temple, neglected the service in the temple, neglected the worship of the temple. And as they repented before God, they realized we need to demonstrate in our lives and before the world that God really is our greatest treasure and pleasure in life. And so in verses 32 through 39, they make certain commitments. In verse 32 and 33, we placed ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of God and for the other things that, that were involved in that. So, number one, they sacrifice their money. They sacrifice their money. You know what? We're going to start sacrificing our finances for the worship, the corporate worship of God in the temple. Look at verse 34. Likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites and the people, so that they might bring it to the house of our God, according to our father's households, at fixed times annually to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as is written in the law. Now, you won't understand that unless you cut wood. You're not going to understand that unless you go out every year, find a bunch of logs, put them in a trailer that you borrowed from Scott Lowry, Drive that trailer to your house, unload all those logs, and you start the process of cutting them into bite-sized pieces for your wood stove and splitting them and stacking them. And and it's a lot of work. Some guys enjoy it. It is kind of a, a, a nice therapy when you're out there splitting the wood. But let me tell you, it is worth. Those guys that sell wood, it's worth every penny they want, I think. And you wouldn't understand this verse unless you go out and get wood. It's work. They're sacrificing their time, their energy, and there wasn't a whole lot of trees. There wasn't a whole lot of trees. They had to go out and find this wood. And they're sacrificing their labor now for the house of God. You come down to verse 35, and they might bring the first fruits of the ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord Henry. There's their, there's their crops. 36, to bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons. There's their children and of our cattle. And the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, as is written in the law for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. Verse 37, we will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree. This is the prophets. They're farmers. This is how they made a living. Now they're going to bring the prophets. As you go through this, you see that they're sacrificing their money, their labor, their crops, their children, the firstborn of their flocks, all their prophets. And, And what they're doing is they're saying this. We want... To live lives that demonstrate that God is really our greatest treasure and pleasure in life. And the way we're going to demonstrate that is we're going to be willing to sacrifice everything else because it's all a lesser pleasure and treasure in life. And the way that we show that God is the greatest of our treasures and the greatest of our pleasures is by the willingness to say, I am willing to sacrifice that. If that is going to bring glory to God and here specifically In corporate worship, you come to the end of verse 39. It says, thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. You know, the reason why that was such a big thing to demonstrate that God was their greatest treasure and pleasure in life. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, is that because all sin comes from not seeing God as the greatest treasure and pleasure in your life. Very quickly, look at Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 2. Repetition is the best teacher. So let's look at it. When God boils down the sins of his people, here's what he says. Jeremiah 2, 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. 
For my people have committed two evils. Now, we've committed lots of sins, haven't we? So did Israel. So did Judah. But he says you can boil it down to two. And here's the two that every sin falls into. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to you for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He said when you boil every sin down, it's this. You chose to sin because you forsook me as the one who could have been your greatest treasure and pleasure. To dig a well for yourself that is cracked that you're going to try and pour your pleasure into. And it won't hold water, he says. Every sin is a result of forsaking God and trying to replace him with something you think is more pleasurable. So they demonstrate that God was their greatest treasure and pleasure in life. And one last thing I want to raise to you as we, we leave the end of chapter 10. Is I find it interesting that the question in, he, in Nehemiah chapter 10 was not for these people, can we ever serve the Lord again? That was not the question. You know what the issue was? Why aren't we serving the Lord again? They didn't come to Nehemiah chapter 10 and say, well, you know what? The, the house of the Lord needs a lot of service and it needs a lot of things going on and, and that. But you know what? We're just we, we screwed up so bad. God wouldn't want me to go out and do that. God wouldn't want me to be in that position. Look at the look at look at what I did. That was never the question. It wasn't. Can I ever serve the Lord again? And that's what people always ask, don't they? They sin against the Lord. And the thing they ask me is this. Do you think I can ever serve the Lord again? That's not the question. The question is, why aren't you serving the Lord again? Do you not believe that he took all your sins at the cross of Calvary? Do you not believe that he completely accepts you because you are in Christ? Do you not believe that you're completely acceptable because you're in Christ? And that your acceptance and fellowship with God has nothing to do with you and what you do and what you don't do, but everything to do with Christ? Why not believe the Scriptures and get back to work? Conclude. Those believers who truly desire to repent of their sin in their lives are, are going to have an earnest desire to do something about their sin. If you don't have an earnest desire to do something about your sin, you're just, you know, blowing snot into a Kleenex. You know, you're not repenting. You're blowing snot into a Kleenex, okay? That's what you're doing. Repentance is when you move beyond that sorrow, and that sorrow moves you to do something about your sin. And if repentance is real and it's being fueled by the Holy Spirit of God, there is going to be great sorrow over sin. There really will. But there's also going to be an earnest desire for holiness. There's going to be a desire to cultivate a preference for obedience to God's Word over sin. There's going to be a desire... To demonstrate that God truly is their greatest treasure and pleasure in life and that they are sorry for ever trying to replace him. There will be such conviction and desire to be right in their hearts that nothing will stop the repentant person from pursuing these earnest commitments with great intensity and fervor, not even concern for what others may think. You know. During the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards was presiding over an unbelievably large prayer meeting. 800 men had gathered to pray. And as they were praying, a note came into the meeting and it was taken to Edwards. It was a note from one of the wives of the men. And she simply wrote on the note that she would like prayer for her husband, who in his spiritual pride had become unloving, spiritually prideful, and very difficult to live with. So Jonathan Edwards just read the note. To his astonishment. And he asked, would the, man, would the man who this note is describing please raise his hand so that we can pray for him? To his astonishment, 300 men raised their hands. <laughs> Immediately raised their hands. You know why? Because they weren't concerned with what other people thought about their repentance. They were convicted by the Spirit of God. They knew they were the man. They raised their hands because they wanted something to be done about their sin. That's what repentance does. You want something to be done about your sin. You want to get rid of it. You want to be free of it. You don't care what others think. Perhaps you are in need this morning of feeling more than just sorrow over your sin. Perhaps there's a need in your life of uniting the works of repentance to your sorrow. Let me just say this. It's the only way that you'll ever experience life after sin. And it's the only way that you'll ever experience great life after great sin. The only way is through repentance. Don't forget, sin always binds, always kills, 
always takes from us more than we ever bargained for. But in repentance, God reverses sin's gains. He reverses it. And he leads us in walking with him as uncondemned, graciously free, gloriously accepted, and eternally secure people who are becoming more Christ-like every day. There is indeed life after sin, but it is always breathed and birthed by repentance. And so this morning, if your need is repentance, come to the throne of grace. You don't need to come to the altar. Go to the throne of grace. I don't have mercy and grace for you. He's got mercy and grace for you. The promise is if you come to the throne of grace, you will find mercy and grace for you in your time of need. If you recognize today that you have not repented of sin, you've just had sorrow, but there has been no change, go to the throne of grace as we sing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Nehemiah chapter 10 and the example of these people who desired to repent. And I pray, Father, that you would cause us to be people who also have an earnest desire to repent of our sins, to be free of them and to move on. And I pray, Father, that we would come before the throne of grace, come before Jesus, our great high priest, who has promised to give us grace in time of need. Help us to realize that we are wanted there, we are accepted there, and our needs will be met there in Jesus' name.